Welcome to the fourth seminar on research data management organized by the consortium of hpc.nrw and we have the, the honor to have uh, today here Justus Kuhlmann. He's Master of Science at the University of uh, Münster. Uh, I think you're from theoretical physics department, right? Yes, that is correct. Yes, very good. Uh, and he's going to talk about the data management system data led, and this is uh, a short uh, timetable um, that, that is going to expect you. And I hope we will all have uh, a fruitful afternoon, uh, morning. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so, first of all, also welcome from my side. And um, yeah, as Oliver just mentioned, um, currently I'm doing my PhD in theoretical physics at the University of Münster. And um, I'm also working for our IT department, so the CIT. Yeah, this talk or um, that I actually concern myself with the topic um, of research data management, I think is basically a synthesis of both of, both of them. Let's just dive right in, right? Um, so I actually want to um, do this talk in two parts and then we have two small code alongs um, and yeah, I hope um, that maybe some of you can follow. Um, otherwise, you can also just watch those. And um, I wanted to um, hand out the source material for that. Um, anyways, I just um, made a GitHub page for that. Um, yeah, and I'll share that later, of course. Okay, so um, we start with part one which I call basics and concept. I um, first of all want to give a small motivation. Um, yeah, basically, why should you actually even follow this talk? And um, I wanted to start with a very broad statement um, that I think computational analysis and computers are ubiquitous in science. I mean, you think you might think to yourself, okay, that's great, actually. I mean, we gain a lot from that. So if you just think about typesetting, for example, um, it's much easier to do typesetting nowadays with, uh, I don't know, I, I use something like LaTeX or maybe Word or something like that. Um, and also when you want to show people what you what you're doing in your research. There are a lot of different plotting tools um, that you can use to make wonderful figures and so on and so forth. Um, and even if you think even a little more broadly, um, I mean, just the access to paper, so the access to literature has been facilitated in the last decades um, by computers. I mean, um, nowadays it's pretty easy to just go on the internet and um, and yeah, basically read as many papers as you like, right? Um, and on the other hand, I also want to uh, point out that there are entire branches of computer-aided science and medicine. And um, so I'm actually from one of those, which is called Lattice QCD. Um, it's a part of um, particle physics. Um, I'll give you a very, very brief introduction to the technical side later on in this talk, but um, we find that, I mean, even though we have all these advantages, um, we, I mean, the final paper that you read is often still a black box to you. And I would argue that is even more the case nowadays than it was, let's say a hundred years ago or so, because um, a hundred years ago, usually, I mean, if you look at like mathematical physics or mathematics or something like that, um, basically what you had to do to more or less redo the whole paper is to think really hard or in more applied fields, like you just redo the experiment. This might cost you a lot of time, but in the end, if you have basically, um, uh, if you have the materials and you have the time, you can do it. To me, that often leads me actually to the thought, how did this result actually come, in, come into existence, right? So where where's the data that this paper, for example, is based on? And 
Um, if you are more thinking about the software side, I mean, um, you might also ask yourself, can I trust the results of this code that someone else wrote? And click again to ask what to do. In recent years, there has been this fair movement. And I, I think that uh, probably most of you have already heard of that. Um, so fair, um, which has been first introduced in this paper that uh, I wrote down below, um, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, uh, and reusable. Uh, so first of all, findable is basically the question for metadata and um, machine readable data and metadata. And um, I mean, this actually facilitates, for example, finding you in something like an index or a search, even though it's just domain specific. The next point uh, would be accessibility, which I mean, in the original paper, I think it's, um, uh, it asks for the communication protocols on a pretty technical level, actually. So how is the data that I ask for actually transmitted to me? So for example, I mean, if you think about websites or something, you have something like, I don't know, an HTML document sent to you via HTTP requests or something like that. So the next point would then be interoperability. And this basically asks the question, um, how easy is it to incorporate your data into another workflow? So, I mean, we, let's say we already found your data or I already found your data and I'd like to use it and I somehow even got access to it. Um, but then I find out that it's some, um, some file format that I can't even read. I mean, yeah, that's still a lot of bits, but like there's, uh, there's no sense to me, so to say. Um, and uh, what I actually wanted to point out um, in this regard is also um, maybe you could think about also what are the standards in your field. So if all of you use, for example, one particular um, uh, one particular file format or something like that um, to shuffle around um, research data between groups um, in one co collaboration or even between collaborations. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to use this format and not some other format. And I think all of this actually um, is finalized by this last point um, that is reuse reusability. And um, I mean, if I already, basically, if I can now import your data, um, I'd also like to know what does, what do I, as the next person who uses your data, um, need to know about this? And um, actually, um, this also asks the question for provenance. So um, provenance basically incorporates everything up to some point, um, or, well, yeah, everything that happened to data or to something else um, up to the point that I get to see it first, basically. And um, the last thing on this slide um, is uh, basically the question, how do we implement these principles, right? Yeah, what I wanted to point out here is um, basically that provenant and reproducibility can be um, a road to basically adhere, adhere to these principles. And um, yeah, first you, I mean, what you could do, for example, is um, to link uh, your data to your final paper, such that, for example, um, if I read your paper, then um, maybe I directly find a link back to the data that you uh, generated for this paper. Um, and this also basically um, comes down, I mean, if you think this further, 
Um, you can also link previous data to the final results that you put into your paper and so on and so forth. So you basically have a chain that is um, back traceable, so to say. Um, then uh, the third point that I wanted to point out here is, I mean, by now at least, um, you can give your data some kind of DOI, so a digital object identifier or something similar. Um, and what this does is basically it enables people um, to, yeah, I mean, to cite your paper. And um, on the same page, there's also that you should think about licensing your code because basically code that isn't licensed is just from a jurisdiction standpoint is, uh, let's say, hard to swallow probably for, yeah, for people or for collaborations, right? Uh, this, I think it enables others to use your data. Um, I think it also builds trust in your data and your papers. So what I mean by that is basically, um, if I see a paper and I don't know what's been going on before, uh, before publishing it, um, then, okay, I would say that um, you could trust it less than if you knew how those how the data that went in there was generated. And um, what also falls into this category is actually um, something that I just read recently. Um, that is, for example, um, I mean, data corruption by basically Bitrot. Um, so what was going on there was basically that um, uh, there was some file corruption uh, going on uh, silently on some file system. And um, I mean, in the end, um, if you can, if you use those files and they are still in the valid format, um, this might go unnoticed. And um, yeah, this is maybe not, um, not the best thing, let's say. Um, and I mean, yeah, if you instead, if you backtrace everything, basically, you can also backtrace such errors. Um, then, I mean, to link everything together, so to say, you directly make it more findable, if you ask me. So again, going to especially for something like a publication, if you link your data to it, I think the data is directly more findable. Um, and what I also want to point out is this backtracing can actually also aid yourself in later projects. Um, so what I mean by that is, um, I mean, if you started a project, I don't know how your project cycles are in your respective fields, but um, I mean, especially so to say in the field where I'm located, uh, projects can take years to to completely um, to complete. Um, and so if I don't know anymore in the end what I did in the beginning, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's not so great, right? Um, so actually to know what I did back then and to have it somewhere written down is also helpful for myself. So here I want to um, basically show on a little more practical level what this could mean for you. So, um, yeah, I've done this in software wise and data wise. Um, we'll see if this actually makes sense. Um, I mean, in the end, software is also basically just data that you compile once. So you do something else with it and then you put other data into it and then it gives you yet another bunch of data. So, yeah to make this distinction, I think is sometimes helpful, um, but yeah, maybe not always. So anyways, um, so on the software side, um, I would advocate for open source software uh, to be used in sciences. I know that this doesn't always make sense for uh, everyone and um, that's absolutely okay. I, I'm not an absolutist, let's say, but um, yeah, I think I, I would advocate for it. And um, then also um, the next thing to make things less complicated, basically, 
is to use the fixed software stack. So what I mean by that is um, if you um, compile code, um, maybe within one project, you could only use one compiler and one version of the compiler, basically. Um, or if you write a lot of Python scripts, use just one Python version. And if you um, use one particular Python package or R package, maybe also use just one version of this R package. And what this gives us basically is that if someone else looks at your data or your software, um, it's easier for them to um, uh, to understand what is going on in your code. And maybe um, it's also easier for you to understand after, let's say, five years, if you look back onto a project, what was going on, or maybe what was going wrong with your data, because maybe you found a bug or something. Um, so it's always good to have like a reference version of all the code that you use, basically. Okay. And um, what I also wanted to point out here is um, it's useful to actually use tools that make your life easier. And um, some of those, I think, make is, uh, is something that a lot of people know. So for those who don't know, make is a, a pretty, well, uh, I don't know if you could say low level, but like it's a very, very common tool in the in the GNU world to build software in the end. Um, so what you do there is basically you write instructions how to compile code such that in the end you basically reduce it to uh, very few commands. And um, alternatives to that is, for example, Just. Just is a, a pretty young project. Uh, it's written in Rust and uh, it's much easier than make on one hand, but um, as far as I'm aware, it's not as powerful. Um, but for example, um, for yeah, for stuff like um, scripts or something like that to just organize them in an easier way, I think this is pretty useful too. Um, and finally, I also wanted to um, point to snake make um, as a Python tool that actually organizes your workflow and makes it scalable as far as I'm aware. Um, I have to say that I don't use this myself. Then if we go further, um, we also have the data side. And what I want you to think about here is in my mind, basically, if you think about it on a very abstract level, so to say, you can think about data as something that is created somehow, then transformed, and then you have a result. And Maybe you use this result and funneled it into another transformation and so on and so forth. Um, basically, what uh, provenance for data comes down to is to track these transformations, right? And um, if you think about, for example, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe polls or um, something like that that are. Um, uh, that are broadened every year, um, it's also useful to think about um, version controlled data. So you have some version 1.0 where you maybe have a poll with 500 participants and then um, uh, maybe you do your first analysis of your, um, of your data and then you think, okay, yeah, maybe there are some correlations or whatever that um, uh, that we didn't think about. So you do another 500 participants and then maybe you have a version 2.0 of your data set, so to say. Um, and I think that is a you know, very simple um, example, but I think it gets the point across. Now we actually get to the point of this talk. What is data led? What is this tool that I want to show you today? So in the words of the maintainers, DataLet is a free and open source distributed data management system that keeps track of your data, creates structure, ensures reproducibility, supports collaboration, and integrates with widely used data infrastructure. To put this into what I just said on the last slide, um, apparently we can track transformations with these tools. Um, it does so reproducibility, uh, reproducibly, Sorry. 
Um, and um, basically, it lets us version control everything via Git. Um, then what is not in here, but uh, what I'm going to tell you directly is um, it uses a tool called Git Annex as a data backend. And finally, it all even helps us to distri distribute data. So that's coming back to, yeah, I mean, basically um, a lot of those points that we made in the FAIR principles, right? If we go to the next slide, I wanted to just scribble down basically the a few ideas of data led. Um, so the basic idea is that you deal in data sets. So for the people who are already familiar with Git, um, this is, I mean, in the end, it's just a Git repository, right? And the idea here is um, that, I mean, as projects in Git, um, they are also self-dependent, basically. And uh, if you need external dependencies, you can link them as a sub data set. So again, for the Git people, um, this is, I mean, in the end, it's just sub modules, basically, if you want to view it on a technical level. So data let um, actually tracks placeholder files per Git and not the files themselves. Um, and uh, that's going to be more important for us in the second part of this talk. We see, uh, I mean, Git repositories can be seen as a data set in the data led sense. So, um, I, yeah, basically, you can, what this tells us is that this distinction between software and, and data that I just made a few slides ago, um, that's a little blurry here, right? So um, as I said, for example, source code can, I mean, also be viewed just as data in the end. Yeah, it ensures versioning and provenance data. Um, we will see how that comes to life in, I think, just a few slides. It even can help you with metadata and labeling. Um, and there, I just want to point out, um, I'm not using this myself, but there's even a, a, an extension for data led. I think it's called data led meta led or something like that. Um, so actually with that, um, it, yeah, basically it helps you to label your data, um, to write proper metadata and so on and so forth. Yeah, data, data is actually read only by default in data led. Um, and you need to consciously unlock it to alter it, um, which, okay, if you ask me, sometimes this is, uh, yeah, this doesn't really help you in your workflow, let's say, but um, actually what this helps you with is, um, I mean, since you need to consciously unlock it, um, it helps you to um, yeah, keep data that in the way that it was. So now I want to talk about very shortly about the installation. So the current version of data led is 1.1.0 from you know, just four days ago. Um, it's written in Python um, and you can even load a Python package called data led installer um, to search for the easiest way to install data led on your system. Um, it relies on Git and Git Annex, which I already pointed out before. Um, so you also need to install those. Um, and for the people who use Linux, um, Git and Python are basically ubiquitous in that world. So the only thing that you have to figure out is Git Annex and um, it can be easily installed um, on most major distributions. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, you, I guess you have to compile it yourself um, with the GHC. Um, one thing that I just realized I absolutely forgot to mention um, is that data led is first and foremost um, a command line tool. Um, and uh, when I listened to um, a talk of one of the maintainers here at my university, um, actually, um, uh, yeah, what he said is um, that it just basically um, creates a more precise 
surrounding. I'm, yeah, I mean, they can still, um, there's still stuff that can go wrong on the command line interface, if you ask me, but um, yeah, I guess um, actually, yeah, I think he was right with that. Okay, on the next slide, um, we see uh, the basic usage. Um, and yeah, I mean, what I wanted to point out here is again, okay, again, that this is helpful if you already have a handle on how to use Git basically. Um, so there are some, or let's say the major um, uh, Git commands are actually re-implemented in datalet. Um, so for example, you have datalet create, which is basically the same as a git init. So this is how you create a data set. Um, then you have something like data let save, and you can give it a message. Uh, the message is actually optional. I should have put that down here. But um, yeah, basically this is a stageless commit. So um, you add something um, to, to the next commit in git, and then you commit it directly, basically. Um, yeah, data like that. Um, so if you know git clone, so if you want to clone some repository, um, uh, it basically does the same. Um, data let status functions, not exactly like git status, but um, almost. Um, most of time you only have one branch in a data let data set, even though you can also use git branching. We'll also get that. Um, uh, get to that later in this talk. Um, and finally, you have something like data let siblings, um, which is uh, basically the same as uh, git remote minus v, so you can view your git remotes. Um, and uh, this also functions only kind of like its um, git counterpart because um, it also shows you if your if the data is also in the same place as um, the git information basically um, yeah we'll we'll see about that in the code along too i hope okay um, and finally what i also wanted to point out is um, you can also use all the git commands that you know and love um, and i mean what yeah, what I mean by that is, um, for example, branching is just um, is just not implemented in datalet, but you can just use git merge and uh, and git checkout and so on and so forth, just as in git itself. On the next slide, then I put down a lot more of the commands that uh, you can use in datalet. So um, uh, you have something like datalet create sibling. And then you have a bunch of um, stuff that you can put there. I didn't even put down all of them here. Um, and basically what it does, it can help you to set up a new sibling um, uh, of the given type or on the given service, so to say. Um, and yeah, as I said, they have a lot of uh, different things there. So you can use this with yeah, your usual Git hosting service, so GitHub, GitLab, Gitty, whatever. Um, then um, uh, what I also want to point out here, um, because we'll need it later, is this uh, create sibling RIA. Um, and RIA in this case stands for remote indexed uh, archive. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, we'll find out later what this actually is. It's a basically a data led only representation of a repository um, and that only uses files. Okay. Um, then um, something that I also wanted to point out is, um, as I said, you need to consciously unlock files that you um, want to change, especially, I mean, this is only true for so for files that you put in this git annex um, and you do the unlock with just a command data let unlock. 
Um, then you have data let install, which is kind of like clone. Um, then you have data let get. Um, now this is something that people who know good annex will already know. Um, but I know that this, or uh, I think that this is not a tool that everyone knows maybe. So um, what this does is since we only track placeholder files with our um, with Git and with data let, um, basically what this data let get command does is it's uh, if uh, the content of a file that we want to read um, is not present locally, um, it will give us uh, it will get us the file from some remote location. And um, yeah, the thing is that we actually don't even know uh, need to know where exactly this file came from. Um, but uh, data let gets it for us anyways and just puts it where it's supposed to be basically. Okay. Um, so, so far, basically all of our commands are just um, avail over, uh, over git and git annex. Um, and now what I want to um, get to is um, this whole provenance thing, basically. And there you have two commands that are central for this, which are called data let run and data let rerun. Um, data let run basically lets you um, execute some command. Um, and what data let does there is um, it takes note of this command. So um, yeah, we'll also see how this works um, later on in, in our code along. Um, but yeah, um, and then data let rerun uh, lets you, well, as the name suggests, I suppose, uh, rerun a command um, that you put in this data let run um, run command. And uh, this is orientated um, through, uh, through commit IDs. So every time you do a data let run, data let commits to the data set in the end. And um, if you use rerun with some commit ID, um, uh, it reruns the command that you put um, to this, uh, or that um, yeah that belongs to this uh, commit ID. Okay. Um, finally, I want to point out that there is actually a data let GUI, which is called GUI. Um, I personally have not used that yet, um, but yeah, for people who are um, yeah, who, um, who are more comfortable with a GUI. Um, well, there you go. Um, and uh, yeah, and the last point is uh, that there's also a copy file um, uh, command with which you can copy files from one repository to an under, uh, another. And um, uh, and basically you can note where to find this file also uh, in remote locations. Um, yeah, this list is obviously not exhaustive. I mean, we've already gone through a lot, but um, yeah, if you look, look into the uh, documentation, I think um, there are still some things that you can learn from that. Um, now I actually wanted to do a code along session with you. This is the first part. Um, there is another part if you, uh, yeah, that we'll get to later. First of all, I again wanted to show how to install data let. On Fedora, you can just find it in DNF um, and uh, use just DNF install and everything will be basically put up for you. Um, on Ubuntu, you can install git and git annex via apt. Um, and then use the Python installation of data let and everything should work fine too, I suppose. Um, I also posted um, a minimal Docker setup um, that I was using when I prepared this talk. 
Um, yeah, I think um, that that is uh, quite helpful, especially because it already installs basically everything for you. Um, so the first thing that we want to try is to actually create a, a new data set. And um, we do this with this data let create command that uh, I showed you before. So if we type that in, it uh, gives that gives us back um, create okay. Um, and then we can switch into the new folder. Then, um, so the next thing that we want to do is since we now have a data set, we actually want to um, add some content to it. And um, for that, I, um, I already prepared the Python script just for, um, yeah, I mean, in the end, it just uh, fits a Gaussian to some data points. And if you copy the this wget command um, that I put in there, um, it'll just download a file and uh, you can, I mean, if you want, you can also just look at the file. It's just a very basic um, Python script. Yeah, I mean, in the end, what this does, it just reads some array and then it fits and plots the same um with with some portion um fitted to it and um, now that we have downloaded this we actually want to um, save these changes to our data set and we do that with this command data let save and then we put a minus m and um, uh, clip the message uh, add analysis script to it if we do that we again get back uh, add okay, save okay, and then it gives us even an action summary of everything that has happened. Yeah, I, on the code along, I also wrote how this script is supposed to work. So you just use your usual Python 3 installation, and then you have some data files, some output file, and that's it. So, all right, so um, I mean, now we actually want to yeah, to take data, basically. Um, and what I wanted you to think about here is that um, maybe this, you already have a data set going around in your collaboration or something like that. Um, and now it's, so to say, your turn to analyze it. So we've already written our script, right? Or, yeah, you copied it. And um, then we can... Uh, use this data let install command with the URL um, to uh, to install, um, so to say, um, the data that we want to fit to um, as a sub data set to our analysis data set. And if you do that, um, it will give you some information um, and then it will say, okay, it, install, okay. Um, and it just gives you the path where it installed your data set. Um, installing sub data sets is also a kind of altering um, the super data set, so to say. And um, therefore, we need to save our data set again. Uh, we do this with this data set, uh, data let save command. Um, and we just say, okay, I added data as a sub data set. Okay. If we put OK, then it says, uh, OK, we added this data, this test data data set. So it even tells you um, what kind of file or data set or folder it is. Um, then um, this is taken note of in this .git modules file. And then, um, yeah, and then it just gives you an action summary again. So now we can um, actually change directories into this test data set. Um, and there you find a readme and some, uh, some data. And the thing is you already see that this is just links to other, to other files. And um, yeah, so now if you want to actually have a look at the data, for example, with less or something like that, 
you find that less says uh, no such file or directory. That is already a little weird. And if we go out of our directory again, um, and we try to run our script, which is this Python 3 dot script, uh, dot script and so on and so forth in the, the code along, we'll also find that Python gives us basically the same error as less. Okay, so um, what's going on here? Basically, for now, we've only installed the uh, the placeholder files of our of our um, test data data set. Um, so if we now use data let get, we we can see that it's okay that uh, he actually got the uh, got the data that we wanted from some source. So as you can see, this does not say from GitHub or something, but actually this is another source. This is an S3 storage that we host at our university. Okay. Um, actually, that reminds me uh, what we haven't had a look at is if you go into the test data set, you can actually find with data let uh, siblings, which siblings it's, it knows of. So, and there it says, for example, uh, it knows of the sibling here, it knows of the sibling origin that is on GitHub. And then it also knows of a third sibling, which is uh, this uni S3. Uh, so if we do this data let get command um, and we try to run our Python script again, um, actually this time it works. So that's already cool, right? Um, and so what we see if we just do a simple ls that is that um, we get a new um, file, which is just the output file of the script, which uh, we just call plot1 because we have this data1 dot out. So I just called it plot1. Okay. So this actually has changed again our data set. We've added this new file. Um, and therefore, we just use this data let save um, command again to, um, to say that we added the first plot. Um, okay, this is all so far so good, so to say. Um, now, the thing is that, um, I mean, so far we've everything done manually. We've taken note ourselves what we actually did um, with all those commits, but um, I mean, this is hardly re reproducible for us, right? And uh, there comes uh, this data let run command again. Um, and um, yeah, if you look at the second to last command that I put in this in these notes, uh, it just says data let run, and then comes uh, come a lot of uh, options. And in the end, you have the actual command that we that we used to uh, to do, but this time with the uh, second data file, and um, it outputs to an, another plot file. Now I want to just go shortly over um, which, so what all of these options mean. Um, basically, uh, you have data let run, and uh, there are also some other options that I didn't include here, of course. But, uh, so you have data let run, and then you put all the inputs that your um, that your command uh, will need with a minus i. So um, basically, since we have a pretty simple command, uh, we need our script file, right? And um, we need our data file also as an input. And um, as an output, we get this new plot. Um, and then the minus m, as before with data, let's save, um, you can attach a message to, um, to your commit, and that's it. If we have a look now um, at the Git history of our um, of our data set, you'll find that um, uh, if you leave out uh, one line, so if you just look at Git log, 
you can even find um, your command that you just put in with the data let run command. What I have to admit, I just forgot to point out is that data let run also takes care of getting all the data that we need to run this command. So that's what we actually use this um, inputs for. So it makes sure that we um, that everything is already there, that everything is there that we need to run the command. Um, and then um, it unlocks the output file if it's already present um, and then it writes to the output file. And now as promised, so to say, we can use our git history um, to also use this data let rerun command. There, um, if you look at git log, um, you just pick up the last uh, commit ID and if you run data let rerun, you just redo so to say the plot that we just made yeah and with this i actually already want to close the first part of the presentation so um yeah just to finish this up basically um i wanted to just very shortly um condense what we've seen so um we've seen how to make a data set what is tracked in a data set um, how to bind another data set to the first one, um, what data let run and data let rerun uh, does. Um, and we've seen with this issue where you needed to do this data let get thing first, uh, that placeholder files are not the same as content files, basically. And um, yeah, I want to point out again that the content is if you have it locally in your repository. It's actually stored in this um, annex directory that you can find under .git slash annex. Um, and then um, I wanted to also point out again that git annex is the tool that actually keeps track of where the contents are. So this works local and remote um, in the sense that um, you can have the content directly in the repository that you're working with, or it can also be stored somewhere else on a, on a local disk and only be asked for uh, with this data let get command if you, uh, if you need it. So for example, you can also just store it on an external disk, um, which is also quite practical for something like backups. I actually now want to um, start with part two. Um, which is on the cluster usage of data led. Um, again, going to the next slide, um, I want to give a small motivation. Um, I mean, we'll see in not that long that this gets a little more difficult than um, in, uh, in the first part that I just showed you, but I hope that I can convince you that this might be worth your time, let's say. First of all, why was I actually motivated to get into this? So um, this is a tool that apparently handles um, large amounts of data. And um, I have large amounts of data. Um, the next point that I want to make is that um, it actually tells me how I did stuff. And um, I always forget how I did stuff. So um, that's already pretty helpful. Um, then what was also as a next point um, interesting for me personally at least um, is that data let has the ability um, to only download parts of your data so that um, again gets back to this data let get command you can give it a specific path to one file that you want to download and um, if we click next again uh, since my laptop only has limited capacity and I don't want to um, buy myself like uh, terabytes of external hard drives, basically, um, this uh, I think also comes in very handy. It also easily integrates with Git and Python since it, I mean, it's based on both. Um, and um, I mean, I already use Git and Python in my workflow. so. Um, yeah, that was actually, so to say, a no-brainer for me. And finally, um, 
I mean, you can you can push data to websites or other servers um, pretty easily with this. So either if you want to um, publish your data, for example, on GitHub or something, uh, you can do this with this tool pretty easily. And also for yourself, I mean, um, yeah, I don't know how it's in your respective fields, but um, in theoretical physics, for example, we usually have contracts for something like uh, maybe three or if you're lucky, four years. Um, and then usually you change your university. And while I, I mean, I trust my university with my data, um, but I think it's still useful to have a personal up, uh, a personal backup. Right? Okay, so it's also easy to make independent backups. All right, so on the next slide, I also wanted to point out um, the pros and cons maybe a little more broadly. Um, so the pros is, I mean, you can use provenance and data versioning on a cluster. Um, you make your workflows more reproducible. And especially I think if, um, this basically comes down to fixed workflows. So if, so as we just discussed uh, with Oliver, um, so if you have a lot of trial and error, for example, in your analysis, um, this might not be the perfect place, but if you already have a fixed workflow, so if you always um, use one script for calculation, for example, um, yeah, for example, on a cluster, um, this makes a, a lot a lot of sense, I think. Um, also, I want to point out, and this is maybe even thought a little further, um, is that you can pretty easily um, use something like distributed computing. So what I mean by that is imagine like you, you not only have one cluster at your home university or something, but you also sometimes you use another cluster at some other university and um, yeah, usually how you would um, get data between those two points um, is just by, I mean, in the end, something like SCP or SSH, right? I know that, for example, um, within um, our state, there are um, some other ideas to shuffle data around. And I think that is actually um, really good and really helpful for people. And um, maybe data lab can just be um, basically yet another um, way to do that. Yeah, what maybe hasn't come out in my talk um, very well yet is that your data management can be cluster independent. So what I mean by that is that, I mean, in the end, it comes down that your repository does not only or can not only be local, but um, again, you can just upload it to somewhere or to your own workstation or um, yeah, whatever you, you have, basically. Um, and uh, this, again, uh, as I already pointed out, actually makes bad backups for yourself uh, much easier. On the other side, um, you have some cons. So we'll see, or maybe, you're already aware that Git and, I mean, by extension, data led um, are not really designed to track parallel processing in one branch. Um, and what I mean in, okay, so in this case, uh, what I mean by parallel processing is um, actually um, uh, to have many things going on at the same time and then be committed in one commit, for example. Um, yeah, that's just not how basically Git is thought thought out. Um, and that's okay. I mean, we just need to find a way around that. Um, but yeah, we'll see about that in just a minute. Um, what I've also found, um, and I don't know, maybe this is specific to the cluster here in Münster, is that um, file transfers can be pretty slow, even if you have high-end file systems. Um, and I think, I'm not sure, um, but this could have to do with the fact that you actually need a lot of, um, well, basically Python calls and calls to other programs for 
uh, before you actually transfer files. So um, yeah, that also makes cluster usage a little uh, less easy since, um, I mean, in the end, what you build all these high file, uh, high speed file systems for is um, that the processes that you run in your cluster um, can actually work continuously, right? So if we just wait around, basically waiting for our files, yeah, that's uh, not really great for cluster usage actually. And um, I mean, if you ask your your cluster admins, I think that most of them will will agree because we always, I mean, we want to we want the the cluster to work in the end, right? Not to just stand around and look nice. Okay, um, and last but not least, and this is something that I would have wished for actually um, when I started with this whole thing, um, is uh, there's no integration with something like work workloads, workload schedulers, for example, something like Slurm. I think this is a nice to have, but I absolutely see um, that um, for people who don't work on on highly parallelized programs, uh, problems um, that this is not their first priority. And from all of that, um, basically, we take um, that we will need to find a workaround, especially for those first two problems um, in our workflow. So on the next slide, I have a very short intermezzo on Lattice QCD because um, yeah, I just wanted to basically again show you why I actually do this. Um, and I'm only gonna get to the yeah, very abstract technical part, so to say, um, uh, of that because uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you are in physics or are even in Lattice QCD, um, but I suppose there are not that many probably. Um, so, I mean, I just wanted to pose the problem, so to say. Um, so, what Lattice QCD is, is it's the non perturbative description out of first prim principles um, for the strong interaction. And um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is in like school physics, but um, basically, the strong interaction is part of the standard model of particle physics. Um, and uh, yeah, to say very roughly what it does is it explains why protons are, are bound together as they are, basically. So you maybe um, know that within a proton, there's actually a substructure um, uh, out of three quarks, two up, down, and a down quark, uh, two up quarks and a down quark, sorry. Um, and um, yeah, there, are, there is basically an entire zoo of particles that are um, bound states out of these, out of these quarks, out of these parts. Um, and uh, so there is not just up and down quark, but also four other ones. Um, we'll, we won't go into detail um, too much, but um, basically what I want to point out here is that usually in particle physics, you can describe things perturbatively so you, I mean, in the end, the solution um, or yeah, the proposed solution, so to say, is um, that you think of a system and then you make small perturbations to it. Um, and uh, if you, the idea is basically if you make enough perturbations, or if you take um, enough orders of perturbations with you, um, then you actually show uh, you have a model of reality, so to say. Okay, um, Lattice QCD does not work like this. Instead, we um, discretize space-time on a four-dimensional lattice. Um, how this looks more or less um, is shown here um, in this really nice figure by one of my colleagues. Um, uh, obviously, this is just a three-dimensional lattice because um, yeah, let's be honest, uh, drawing something in four dimensions is often not that easy. Um, and um, then basically the idea is uh, that you solve very high dimensional integrals um, 
using Monte Carlo techniques. And uh, yeah, I think that this is actually the point where most of you or some of you are maybe um, in again. Basically, the idea here is that you can solve an integral by um, more or less probing um, the area of integration um, at many, many points. And then um, I think it's the central limit theorem that tells you then that um, uh, if you take the mean over all those probes, um, you can estimate the integral. Okay. Um, in our case, uh, thanks to a lot of analysis, uh, basically you can actually, um, you can split up the, the integration into, into um, three parts. So first, uh, you can generate a lot of Monte Carlo samples. Um, the second part is then that you basically um, calculate something on those Monte Carlo samples. And um, finally, in your analysis, you actually, uh, yeah, you basically, I mean, in the end, you take the mean and do a lot of, um, uh, a lot of fancy statistics and you get your result for your integration. Okay, um, finally, what I also wanted to point out here is uh, that Lattice QCD is um, a prime candidate for, for um, HPC since uh, its problems are actually very highly scalable um, and are very computationally expensive. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, or, yeah, there are a lot of HPC systems that are uh, yeah, that are run not entirely for lattice QCD, but that are that do a lot of lattice QCD. Um, on the next slide, um, I wanted to just give you a very small impression on what my daily workflow is, basically. Okay, so um, you have basically an input, so that can be parameters, code. Um, those Monte Carlo samples that I just talked about. Um, and uh, then since you can calculate stuff on each Monte Carlo sample separately, um, you can basically um, take all of them and process them in parallel if you so desire. Uh, or if you can, I mean, yeah, you also need the computational power in the end. Okay, um, and so that is shown here in the middle. That's what I try to sketch here in the middle. Um, and those, those things are all done on the cluster. And then I collect all of them and put them into my analysis. And from that, I gain some result. And actually this analysis step, so to say, that can run on my, on my laptop. Um, we use Python for this because yeah, basically it's uh, it's not as computationally expensive. In fact, it's much less computationally expensive actually. Um, and um, yeah, in recent years we chose Python just because um, it enables you to um, have a fast development momentum in the end. And it's, I mean, it's also highly integrated with um, uh, with with other workflows, right? Okay, um, also in this analysis, um, you just include this, the statistics that you need and afterwards you can look at the result. Okay, so the question that I've posed here um, above is um, how do I map this on, on my own research? Like, yeah. Um, so now I want to uh, talk you through it basically, at least how I do this. I ah, guess the last question on this uh, slide is how do we track this? First, uh, I want to again post our problem. So the problem is uh, to track data in parallel um, reliably and with a small overhead. The proposed solution, so to say, is to set the whole thing up as one flow of data and um, there we will just copy the repository in three stages. So on the cluster, we do a setup stage 
calculation stage and the result stage, so to say. Then from the result stage, we can funnel this into our analysis or whatever. It's important to us, um, as we will see in just a moment, um, that the provenance data and the content um, of the files do not need to be stored in one place. Um, and uh, what this enables us to do is to make fast and safe Git commits on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, we um, can push data to another location and collect it later. So um, basically, we first split up data and provenance data, and afterwards we um, we glue them back together. Okay. And the last point on this slide is again basically how do we do this with the tools at hand? Ria stores are flat, flexible, file-based repository representations. And um, I mentioned those before as uh, a means of backup. Um, so, yeah, uh, the second point is um, that they are good for those. Um, then, I mean, as a third point, I wanted to point out that uh, you can even compress those with 7-zip. And this allows you to basically go through even the compressed folder uh, and only uncompressed data that you actually need. Yeah, fourth uh, is that actually for us, um, it's interesting that it's, that these RIA stores are also able to um, only hold content of uh, only hold the content of files locally. So this will this is the thing that will actually enable us to do what we just um, thought about doing on the last slide, where we actually split up our um, the content of the data and the provenance data into two separate things. Yeah. So the idea for us is basically to take this as our content storage. Yeah. On the next slide, I want to talk uh, you through basically what I'm doing uh, as a cluster workflow. Um, with data led on uh, on one of my projects. Um, and uh, yeah, first of all, I wanted to point out that this uh, workflow is actually based on uh, on the paper that I put in the footnote there, um, which I also want to um, uh, really want to acknowledge as a good resource for this. Um, yeah. I think in the paper, it's also mostly on the workflow um, and basically what the authors gain from that. The thing that we want to do is um, that, as we said, we want to have the setup phase, then we have what have a calculation phase, and in the end, we want to have some result. And we actually um, split this in different repositories each time. So basically, um, first we set up a base repository. Um, which is the first point here. Um, then, uh, since we can, at least in my case, naively um, parallelize the workflow, we uh, copy um, this base repository to to a temporary temporary location um, and calculate there. When we are done with the calculation, um, we push the data to this RIA store that I just introduced to you. Um, and we push the provenance data um, with a git push. And um, what I want to point out here is that we use this flock file lock um, uh, in order to make sure that we don't push two things at the same time to the same Git repository, because uh, yeah, actually Git can't really handle this. OK. Um, and all of this is done uh, in the end um, uh, yeah, to, so to say, on one hand, have the provenance data fixed. And this can work very fast because there's very little data that we actually need to push um, into this Git repository. And um, on the other hand, we have a slow connection, so to say, that actually pushes all the data, but in the RIA store, we don't really care about which data came with. Okay. And um, then, as I said, um, as a, what is it, fifth and sixth point, um, 
we can uh, actually collect the data from our RIA store and um, then from our Git repository, um, we can distribute the data to, to our consumers basically. And uh, consumers in this case can mean that it's different people from maybe our collaboration who specialize in now in the analysis or if we do the analysis ourselves, uh, it can also be ourselves. And um, yeah, so what I wanted to um, show here in this graph is you can also dish out basically uh, your data via yeah, your favorite Git service and maybe some S3 store to actually hold the data. Or I mean, in the end, you can also just leave it on the cluster if everyone has SSH access to, to that or something like that. Yeah, one last point on this slide that I want to make is um, you have to be a little careful with this. Um, in the end, you have your data actually at least twice. Um, and I think your HPC admin will, will be very happy um, if you actually delete all the data that you don't need anymore. Um, so what I mean by that is that in this temporary calculation phase here, um, maybe if one of your calculations fail, um, you somehow need to actually clean up behind yourself, so to say. Uh, the same is actually also true in the end uh, for your RIA store, because that's, I mean, you can also put it somewhere else, but um, I put that also on our cluster. And um, yeah, basically once you funnel all your data into your Git repository, you have your data at least once in your RIA store and once in your Git repository. And yeah, that doesn't really make um, that much sense to have the same data twice on, on the same cluster. Um, so on the next slide, you can see that this is actually the time for the second code along. So as pointed out here, I mean, again, uh, this part is largely based on uh, on the structure of of data flow, basically that I of the paper that I just pointed out, um, and um, yeah, now I mean this happens after you after the after the basic usage, and basically in step three or so of the basic usage, uh, we have our data um, repository set up and everything. And now I want to I want you to imagine that your laptop in your um, office uh, is actually the supercomputer that you're working with. So the first thing that we want to do is um, uh, that we want to set up this RIA store that we want to push to later on, um, and we do this with this uh, command. Um, data let create sibling RIA, then we have to give it a name. So, I mean, we just call it RIA, or you can give it whichever name you want. So that's this minus S keyword. Um, and then we actually need to tell data let that it's okay that there's no store yet in this, um, in the location that we'll give, on, give later on. Uh, so that's this new store OK. And then we say that this RIA store is supposed to be only a storage sibling and it uh, won't have a, it's not a Git sibling for us. So it doesn't track the, the Git commits, but it only tracks, uh, so it only holds the files, so to say, that we, uh, that we want. OK. And then uh, the, the RIA stores always start with this prefix called RIA plus, and then you can have plus file if it's local or plus SSH if it's an SSH location or plus HTTP or so on and so forth. Um, and then, um, okay, I started here um, with uh, being in the analysis data set that we um, used before. And then basically we just want to put this RIA store as directly adjacent um, to our uh, to our data set. Okay, then uh, we want to push to that, um, and then we go out of our um, 
uh, analysis data set and we create a new analysis data set that we call analysis underscore sync um, directly next to it. And um, there we'll also just have this, the same files as the in the analysis data set. Okay, so just for you to, so to say, um, uh, follow what we've done so far. So for now we've um, done the setup stage where we um, where we have all of our inputs and we created, so to say, the two final repositories. So this RIA repository and the Git repository um, that we want to push in later. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so now uh, with the next commands that I um, put down there, um, we uh, want to go back into this into the setup stage. So in our old repository that we had so far, and um, we'll uh, we'll make a job script uh, such as we would also do in uh, in other HPC applications. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I've given you this job script, so maybe we can just uh, go through that pretty pretty quick. Um, so first, we want to set some variables. So my source will be um, the absolute path to the the source data set, so the data set that we are currently in. So this analysis data set that we created in the first part, um, we need some uh, work directory and we'll just take, um, for example, slash temp as our temporary directory um, that we can also um, clean up later. Then uh, we set the path to the sync repository. So that's uh, the path to this um, repository that we called analysis underscore sync in uh, in the first step of this code along. And finally, um, uh, since we want to uh, be a little wary about um, when we push what in our Git repository, we also um, need a, a log file and we um, store where this log file is in this variable called log. Okay. Um, well then, because this is a very simple setup, um, we just use a variable called number and we can uh, hand that over to the script in its first argument. Um, and uh, now the actual script starts, right? Um, so what we do is we we clone um, our source repository into our um, temporary directory. Um, then we go, we just go directly there with the cd command. Um, and in this new directory, um, we actually open a new git branch. So First, we um, make sure that our sync is actually known to this new repository that we just cloned. And then we open a new, a new Git branch within this repository. Okay. Um, then we need to do this data let install minus R. Minus R is uh, for um, recursive. So we recursively um, install all the all the data sets that are um, linked here as subdata sets, and um, uh, and then the second command. Actually, I forgot to um, put this out of this uh, of this code along. You don't really need that. Uh, what it does is it enables um, this sibling uh, uni s three. Um, for the for this test data data set. Okay. Um, then comes our data let run command. Basically, it's the same command as uh, I've shown you before. Um, 
Uh, and uh, there um, you see that we just replaced the number two that we've seen in the first part by this variable called number that we hand over to the script. Um, and then <clears throat> comes the critical part, so to say, um, where we do two pushes and uh, one is a data led push. So there we push the actual content of our files to this RIA store. And then the second command in this publish part is uh, this F lock um, with the lock file. And then uh, we do git push sync. Okay, so what this does it is uh, it um, does a simple git push to the sync repository that we um, that we set up, and this f lock lock um, basically um, yeah it uh, it takes care of the fact that there could be the case where two of uh, our workers are done at the same time, so they wait for each other. Um, basically, that then one uh, pushes first, and then the next one pushes afterwards with uh, into the into our git repository okay um i've scribbled that down basically in the next few uh, in the next few lines of of these notes um and then afterwards what i have not done in in our um, in our script here is uh, to do this data let drop um, command and um, uh, and uh, CD work directory and so on and so forth. Basically, what this does is um, it just cleans up after our worker. Basically, maybe the the takeaway message from this is um, uh, in order to circumvent this problem that we can't. Um, uh, that we can't process stuff in Git parallelly, uh, at least not on the same branch. We um, open new um, temporary um, repositories, and on those we open a new branch where we do the actual calculation, and then we push those new branches to some new, um, or to actually two new um, uh, repositories in order to circumvent basically file system limitations. Um, now, obviously, uh, you could do multiple data led run commands in one script, but like, yeah, um, whatever you like, right? Okay. Um, okay, so when we're done with setting up our job script, we do a data let save to say that we added the job script. Um, and uh, the thing is, uh, now we actually have to make our sync aware of this, uh, of this change. So we change to the sync folder, um, we update there, and uh, that's basically it. Okay, and um, now we can try out our script, right? Um, uh, so we go back to our um, original analysis folder, and um, there we can use bash job script dot uh, three for to process our third data uh, file. Okay, and um, now we want to actually have a look if. Uh, if this, if the new branch that we created is all is also uh, in our sync, so to say, um, and we can uh, we can go back to our sync. Um, if we have a look at Git branch, we see um, that there's actually a new branch called calc underscore three, um, and then we can just use basic git commands, so git merge um, to merge the new plot into our main main branch, and then um, we use this uh, git branch minus d to delete the new branch or the merge branch, I suppose. Okay. Um, yeah. To check if everything's okay, we can just have a look with ls what's in our 
directory. Um, the thing is though, that if we try to do a data let get, as I uh, wrote down here uh, on this new plot, we find that um, this is actually not possible. And um, the thing is that Git Annex uh, uh, is not aware yet where we actually push the data to. Um, so to change that, we um, use Git Annex file check or file system check is FSCK. Um, and then we put the name of the sibling with this minus F command um, to point Git Annex to check this one particular sibling. Okay, so uh, so our sibling is called Ria, so we just put Ria there. Okay, and um, after this ran, uh, we can try again to to pull the plot with uh, data let get, um, and then actually it works. Okay. Um, last but not least, as maybe a small play around, basically, um, I wanted to show you that even on your own computer, you can see that our strategy actually works in parallel, so to say now. Um, so what we do for that is actually we just push all the job scripts in the background in our console, um, which is shown in these next two lines. Um, and um, yeah. And if we do that and um, we go back to the sync, we can merge all of them um, uh, by hand, so to say. And then we would actually, again, have to use this git annex file check thing um, to, uh, again, make git annex aware of, um, of where to find uh, the stuff that we just merged. Um, and uh, I mean, we just did this for four different data um, data files. So that's kind of okay to still do that by hand. But um, if you, yeah, I mean, if you do this on a cluster or if you do this with much larger data sets file-wise, um, uh, there might come, come up something where if, um, not even dozens, but like hundreds or thousands of new branches. Um, that you need to merge. And um, that's why in the very last um, code block here, I just wanted to give you a script um, with which you can automatically, so to say, um, merge all of those new branches um, back to into your, into your main branch. So I hope that I've convinced you that DataLab can help us to make our research more reproducible um, and that this in turn helps us to adhere to those fair guiding principles. Um, this, I'm very much aware this, that this takes more time in the beginning. Um, to be honest, to get everything working uh, on a cluster, to even install data lit on a cluster, that actually took me quite some time. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't have any help with that. So I hope that with something like easy build and so on and so forth, um, that's much easier for other people to do. Um, so it takes more time in the, in the beginning, but in my opinion, at least, um, this is time well invested because yeah, it actually writes up for you what you've done so far, basically. Um, I think that for an analysis workflow, so if you would just use that on your own um, uh, um, uh, on your own yeah on your own laptop or something, um, this is actually fairly easy. Um, but on a cluster, this gets more complicated if you want to do this, these parallel work, workflows, if I, as I've just shown you. Um, but again, I think that this is worth your time. Um, in the end, you know, you have to know that yourself. Um, and uh, the very last slide um, is uh, additional content and further reading. So I very much um, want to um, want to acknowledge this, the data led website and 
especially the handbook. Um, and in particular, the handbook is very, um, very helpful. Actually, it's, I mean, basically it's written as a small story where you learn how to get around um, the basics of data led and they also have uh, advanced topics and so on and so forth. Um, they also have a cheat sheet. Um, then the second to last link is again, something um, that points you to the fair principles. Um, and especially with um, the workflow on the cluster, but also if you want to um, uh, include more complicated siblings to your data led data set, um, since it's built on Git Annex, I also want to um, point you to the documentation of Git Annex because this is um, yeah, actually very helpful or was very helpful for me in setting everything up for myself. That's actually everything from my side. I'm sorry that I couldn't show the slides myself again. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I hope that you took something from this talk in any case. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, of course, um, please feel free to ask.